Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today in our uh, online virtual event titled Patterns of Torture in Bahrain, uh, especially with the launch of the joint report between Gulf Center of Human, uh, Gulf Center of Human Rights and uh, Bahrain Center for Human Rights and Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. Uh, this comes also uh, as, as a side event during the 46th session of the Human Rights Council. Um, Torture, of course, is a, a, a crime that is recognized by uh, international law. However, what we have seen in uh, countries in the region, especially with the focus today of Bahrain, that there is such pattern, there is such uh, a practice done by authorities uh, uh, in the country, uh, whether it's the Ministry of Interior in the country, the CID, or uh, some other uh, uh, security forces or security agency in Bahrain, where human rights defenders, political prisoners, prisoners of conscience, women human rights defenders, all of them went through uh, 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 such an humane treatment that we certainly can call it a torture. Also, this event is important because 10 years ago today, uh, leaders of the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain have been arrested and subjected to severe torture. In few weeks from now, our colleague, Abdel Hadi Khawaja, one of the founding members of Bahrain Center for Human Rights, and also one of the founding members of Gulf Center for Human Rights have been arrested and went through severe uh, 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 violations of uh, this uh, heinous crime of torture. Uh, when I read a testimony that was presented to me, from a, a, a current victim of uh, torture, a survivor of torture. When he said, uh, I have heard a lot people say that i rather die than live. However, I never thought in my life that I would say that to myself when I seen humanity in front of me being denigrated, when I felt that I no longer uh, uh, is a human and my life has no value. And when he said, I heard a lot of torture, who felt the pain while the practice of this heinous crime was taking place against him. Mr. Hassan Mshema, one of the leaders of the pro-democracy movement, or Mr. Abdul Wahab Hussain, or Dr. Abdul Jalil Singais, or our colleague Naji Fatil, and so many Bahrainis uh, call them, they are survivors of torture, but the torture never ended. It's still going on. Torture is not, it does not stop at physical abuse, it continued to mental abuse and deprivation of liberty according to the working group of arbitrary detention and the Committee Against Torture, the United Nations Committee Against Torture uh, is form of torture. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my excellent uh, 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 panelists today who are uh, experts in this field and work, whether in writing this report or documenting the abuses when it comes to the uh, heinous uh, crime of torture. Uh, I have Claire Naveen, a researcher with Gulf Center for Human Rights, uh, Asma Darwish with Bahrain Center for Human Rights, and Shawan Jabbarin, the General Secretary for FIDH. So without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Claire. Please, Claire. Hussein, thank you very, very much. Um, it's, it's truly an honor to represent the Gulf Center for Human Rights as we launch our joint report alongside our colleagues from Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, the International Federation for Human Rights, and the World Organization Against Torture. And this report is entitled Patterns of Torture in Bahrain, Perpetrators Must Face Justice. So you will see from that title that the focus of the report is in two parts. First, it identifies the very specific means by which torture is carried out in Bahrain and what its purposes are, what it means to achieve. But secondly, accountability is a core tenet of this report. We are focusing not just on looking at the patterns, but also how we can move away from this long-standing culture of impunity to one of accountability. And we must look in that regard, not just at Bahrain itself, but also at how we can hold the international community accountable for its complicity in allowing torture in Bahrain to continue unabated. And we have a number of proposals in this regard, which I will outline later in, in the presentation. But starting with the first part of the report and our main findings and the patterns of torture, 
you know, we're marking the 10th anniversary this year of the 2011 popular movement in Bahrain. So of course, our, collection, our collective attention is focused on reflecting how the human rights situation has developed in the interim. And we're all here acknowledging that torture is a key part of how that has developed. And torture is central in maintaining Bahrain's authoritarian style of governance and propping up an oppressive, oppressive criminal justice system that specifically targets dissenting voices from human rights defenders to political activists to journalists and anybody who criticizes um, the government. And there are three main patterns that we have identified based on extensive um, overview of secondary sources, but also the brave first-hand testimonies that we've received from Mohammed Sultan and his brother Yunus Ahmed Sultan. And I thank them very, very much for their contribution to this report. It would not be the same without them. And the brief overview I will be able to give today of their testimonies does not do them justice. So I really encourage everybody to look at the report um, and to fully read um, their accounts as survivors. So the first pattern that we've identified is that torture is a systematic part of the Bahraini justice system. Bahrain is one of the most heavily policed countries in the world. And the Ministry of Interior Police Force is frequently described as one of the single most abusive government agencies in Bahrain. They help systematically perpetrate torture um, alongside other Bahraini officials in government buildings and prisons. And human rights defenders, political activists, online activists, journalists and other dissenting voices bear the brunt of this. And the use of torture in this context has a very specific and a very targeted purpose. It interacts and reinforces, mutually reinforces an oppressive legal system where overly broad anti-terrorism legislation is used to incriminate peaceful human rights defenders and anybody who displeases the authorities. We've heard from Mohammed Sultan um, who described how he was brought to the criminal investigation department where he was tortured and asked to confess he wasn't even told what he was being asked to confess to. And over several weeks of torture at the criminal investigation department and later in Dry Dock's prison, he was frequently tortured with the aim of getting him, later they admitted what they wanted him to confess to, and it was to hiding weapons or having direct knowledge of the use of weapons by peaceful protesters during the popular movement, which are completely without foundation and which of course he denied. His brother, Yunus Ahmed Sultan, years later was targeted um, and he suffered horrendous torture by officers allegedly under the command of General Sheikh Rashid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa. His summons was directly in relation to his brother Mohammed's uh, human rights or as uh, the authorities called it, terrorist work. Um, he was brutally tortured whilst being interrogated about his brother and accused of conspiring with him. Something that's really remarkable in Eunice's um, account of the torture he suffered was the complete impunity with which um, the authorities committed that torture. Eunice said he would complain to the courts um, about this. He was told that the courts, it didn't matter, they did not care, the courts would do nothing. And this brings us to the second pattern of torture we have identified, and it's the widespread admissibility of confessions extracted by torture in criminal proceedings obviously contrary to all international and national human rights norms. The courts and the overall justice system in Bahrain not only fail to investigate the torture testimonies of defendants, but they admit and allow the courts to rely on the confessions extracted by torture. Most recently in July 2020, to give one example, the Court of Cassation in Bahrain reaffirmed the death sentences of Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa, despite evidence that the men were tortured during, during their interrogation. And strikingly, at least five of the six individuals were executed since Bahrain ended the moratorium on the death penalty in 2017, were convicted on the basis of confessions obtained under torture in trials marred with serious due process violations. Finally, the third pattern we have identified is that torture is used very systematically as a chilling effect on exercising rights such as freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and association. And the Bahraini 13 is uh, one of the most emblematic examples of this tendency. And we think of our colleague um, Abdul Hadi Al Hawaja, who's a prominent human rights defender, a co founder of the Bahrain Centre for Human Rights and the Gold Centre for Human Rights who was soon to mark in April 10 years in prison 
Um, in January of this year, Abdul Hadi complained of restrictions on phone calls with his family. He hasn't seen them since January 2020. He has been hit, hundreds of his books have been confiscated, reading materials, and he's been denied crucial medical treatment. And recently, when we look at how Bahrain has handled um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the authorities releasing uh, 1,486 prisoners um, on humanitarian grounds for a lot of them, when we look at the striking hesitancy to not release human rights defenders, activists, journalists and dissenting voices, we can see that there is clearly a pattern of oppression and the targeted use of torture against these people in prisons in Bahrain. So this turns to the second part of the report. Um, we've diagnosed the problem, but what do we do about it? How do we ensure accountability? Well, accountability must, of course, happen domestically in Bahrain. Um, for years and years, going back to the Bahrain's Independent Commission of Inquiries findings on the use of torture, the constant calls of bodies such as the UN Committee Against Torture, the Universal Periodic Review, and calls from human rights organisations to establish independent and effective and well-resourced national preventative and accountability mechanisms. We are yet to see that happen in practice. Bahrain often points to the existence of these mechanisms, existence in name alone in many cases, as proof of compliance. But there is a huge discrepancy between the mere existence of these mechanisms and their implementation and effectiveness as a matter of fact. But really, there is no current incentive for Bahrain to change anything. Um, and that is a key finding of this report. Bahrain evades international accountability. First of all, it's not a state party to the Rome Statute of the ICC. Furthermore, it enjoys the complicity of the international community, and particularly, it must be said, of the UK, which is one of the most ardent and loyal supporters of its former colonial protectorate. In 2019, the UK lifted its ban on arms in Bahrain, and in the past year alone has hosted a number of high profile diplomatic visits from officials, including Prince Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, National Security Advisor and fourth son of King Hamad, and Bahrain's Foreign Minister, Dr. Abdul Hadi bin Rashad Al Zayani. But legal accountability can be achieved. The UK, after all, is a state party to the UN Convention Against Torture. State parties to the Convention are obliged to use universal jurisdiction to prosecute, prosecute perpetrators of torture before national courts. This is also um, a legal obligation inscribed in domestic legislation in the UK. In receiving Prince Nassar, the UK arguably failed to respect its obligation under universal jurisdiction to prosecute individuals accused of torture. The UK is also obliged under Global Human Rights Sanction Regulations 2020 to impose further domestic obligations to implement sanctions, including asset freezes and immigration controls for activities occurring inside or outside the UK, and this includes torture. But Bahrain is also the recipient of quite extensive technical assistance and substantial funding that supports and facilitates the use of torture. The Special Investigations Unit and the Ministry of the Interior Ombudsman received funding from the UK. Huddersfield University in Yorkshire continues to provide officers from Bahrain's Royal Academy of Policing with an exclusive Masters of Science course in security science. And according to a Freedom of Information request, the university management failed to conduct human rights due diligence before signing this contract. If all of that wasn't enough, in 2018, the British spyware manufacturer Gamma Group was sued in the UK courts for selling the Bahraini government software allegedly used to target human rights defenders and dissidents in Bahrain. This violates the UK's obligation as a party to the Vassanar arrangement to promote greater responsibility in the export of weapons and dual use goods and technologies. These principles are also clearly enshrined in the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. This is not to overly focus or target the UK in this. I mean, Bahrain does, of course, benefit and enjoy a lot of complicity broadly in the international community. But that unique relationship that goes back with the UK and um, back to the time when Bahrain was a colonial protectorate, it still continues to this day and in further incentivizes and gives no incentive whatsoever for Bahrain to ensure accountability and stop the perpetration of torture. 
So our conclusions, um, we've seen how torture is systematically used in the justice system. Um, convictions are unsafe. They are based often on confessions extracted by torture with dissidents, peaceful protesters, human rights defenders, journalists, and anybody who displeases the authorities bearing the primary brunt of this. We focused our attention next on looking at the international community because ultimately accountability must start there um, because, because we've seen for the last 10 years that accountability in Bahrain is still quite some way away. Um, so I'd like, based on that, happy to answer more questions later, but I, I would like now to pass over to my colleague as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, for your uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, highlight some of the uh, points or uh, uh, sound. Uh, it, it struck me when you said Bahrain has no in incentive to basically abide by uh, uh, international law or there is no sense of accountability. Uh, in the country, or the current local laws does not, or laws do not prevent torture in the country, and it has gotten to the highest level officials. When we talk about the son of the king, Nasser bin Hamad, that he's allegedly accused of uh, uh, torturing dissident or uh, uh, athlete, uh, or we, we still have the same uh, Minister of Interior, Sheikh Rashid Al Khalifa, uh, at, as the head of the Ministry of Interior in the country after 10 years of report after report, recommendations from the Committee Against Torture uh, and finding of uh, the BICI report and finding of other UN treaty body communication, he's still the Minister of Interior, which means there is uh, an ignoring, complete ignore or complete shutdown at the highest level in the country. And of course, your example or your discussion of UK support is certainly uh, concerning that you have a country that in theory uh, claimed to promote democracy and human rights val values around the world, but at the same time support and, and prop uh, uh, a government like Bahrain that uh, has systematic, like you have said the report found, systematic practice of this heinous uh, crime of torture. With that, I would like to uh, 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 turn my attention to Asma. Asma Bahrain Center for Human Rights is one of the oldest leading human rights organization uh, on the ground. Uh, in your documentation for this report, uh, or uh, in your presentation for the Committee Against Torture, uh, what, what, to, to what level can we say torture is systematic in the country uh, when you look at the testimonies from the victims? That's why the floor is yours. That's why the floor. Yeah, I heard you well, Asma, you Hussain, but uh, apparently it was muted. So uh, thank you so much for um, organizing this event and for having me as a speaker. Uh, of course, um, Bahrain Center for Human Rights has also published this report um, and uh, it was produced in collaboration with the Gulf Center for Human Rights and with the support from the European Union. And the report was published in February 2021 of this year. And it's uh, titled, uh, Torture is the Policy and Impunity is the Norm. And in this report, we discuss uh, many uh, findings and we come to a conclusion and we provided also recommendations. Uh, the report um, give a background of the torture uh, in Bahrain and then uh, it also discusses Bahrain's international obligations regarding torture. And uh, then it outlines the practices of the security agencies in detention centers. And also it names uh, some of the officials that were involved in torture practices. 
Um, so this report basically names and shames those officials. Uh, and then um, in the last uh, part of the report, uh, we um, talked about the victims and survivors of the practices of the security agencies, which included uh, political activists, human rights defenders, and uh, those who are on death row or are uh, were already executed, and also some of the protesters who uh, got um, and who got tortured, basically. And um, at the end of the report, of course, we concluded and we, give, we gave some uh, recommendation to the government of Bahrain, to the king of Bahrain, and then to the international community. To give a bit of background of the um, uh, political and social movement in Bahrain and how torture was systematically used against uh, uh, pro democracy um, uh, activists, it, it's important to say that uh, Bahrain has witnessed several uprisings throughout uh, its history. And since before its independence, different popular movements uh, have sought the same goal, a, democrat a democratic society with equal rights. These peaceful movements uh, have been faced with force and resulted in increased repression. The last popular movement of February 2011 was so not different to the previous ones. From the first day of the 2011 popular movement, the Bahraini government chose to resort to force to end the peaceful demonstrations. Many protesters were killed because of the security forces brutality, either on the streets or under torture and detention centers. Local and international reports have documented hundreds of cases of torture and also ill treatment. The UN concerned bodies and different international organizations have called on the Bahraini government to address the violations and end impunity. Almost a decade has passed since 14th February 2011 and nothing has changed. Under international law, Bahrain has an obligation to address torture and other cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment or punishment. Although since 2011, Bahrain has introduced several reforms to address illegal practices committed by its security forces, torture is widespread and systematic. According to the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, documentation Almost every person has been arrested as a result of the as the result of the 2011 popular movement was subjected to different levels of ill treatment during arrest, interrogation, uh, detention, and in prison. The security forces torture detainees either to extract confessions or as a punishment for participating in the protest. Different types of physical and psychological torture were committed against detainees in different police stations, security apparatus, uh, detention centers, and prisons. The security forces have not spared prominent opposition figures and civil society activists from torture and degrade degrading uh, treatment. The Bahraini law in itself prohibits uh, torture and stipulates life imprisonment for those for those who commit torture and leads to death, the, the, the torture that leads to death. Despite thousands of torture cases, convictions for uh, preparators have been low with light prison sentences, even if torture has led to death. In Bahrain, impunity seems the norm. The government has not taken any serious and effective steps to end either torture or impunity. Therefore, it appears that the reform undertaken by the government are misleading, as there is no genuine intention to stop the violations committed against detainees, who are punished for the exercise of their fundamental rights to freedom of expression and association guaranteed by all international human rights conventions. Um, to also discuss um, the um, the types of um, the torture or ill treatment practiced by security forces against uh, activists or detainees, and according uh, to testimonies uh, we received. Uh, from a number of civil society activists also, um, the, the following took place. 
in detention and investigation uh, rooms. So um, interrogation for prolonged, prolonged uh, hours while being blindfolded. Uh, no lawyer was allowed uh, for the proceedings. Severe beatings, insulting the detainees beliefs and religion, personal insult and humiliation, psychological torture, especially the threat of rape, verbal harassment, sexual assault, and being stripped naked, electrifying detainees, intimidating detainees and threatening them with targeting members of their families if they do not if they do not stop their activism, forcing detainees to publicly announce that they have stopped their human rights work. And more uh, practices has been also uh, testified and they are defined by the UN uh, uh, Commission Against Torture and that also included hitting feet with rubber hoses or batons, slapping and kicking the detainees and beating them with tools, forcing detainees to stand for long periods, blindfolding and handcuffing for extended periods of time, threatening detainees with death, holding detainees in painful uh, positions, hanging detainees by their hands and feet, exposure to extreme temperatures, sexual abuse, in, including forced nudity, refusing to give prisoners access to toilet facilities for uh, long times and periods, um, refusing to give prisoners access to clean water for drinking and washing, verbal abuse, and of course, by a psychological torture that includes uh, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, solitary confinement, intimidation. Uh, there were also injuries um, uh, included um, in, in all of this process. There were scars and signs of physical abuse, uh, bruising caused by beatings, scars around the wrist uh, caused to the uh, cause, uh, um, because of the um, uh, placement of tight uh, instruments uh, around the wrists. Uh, shoulder joint dysfunction because of being handcuffed to the back. Um, also, some burns on the bodies of the victims. Uh, our report also um, name uh, the the uh, those those officials who uh, practice torture. Uh, I will encourage you to read the report in detail because it gives a um, sort of background of, of these officials and what, what really happened to them. Most of them got promoted, in fact. Um, and then um, to conclude, um, to conclude uh, we found out uh, in this report after our research that um, none of these victims that were subjected to torture or ill treatment and those who survived also torture nor their families uh, had access to justice uh, or redress. Um, people who inflicted physical and psychological pain upon them are still free and they have faced no punishment. Ensuring adequate and effective remedies for uh, those victims and survivor, their survivors are uh, is a human uh, duty and, and a responsibility. And uh, in order um, to ensure that the action of torture and ill treatment are eliminated and also monitored and to bring to justice the, the, um, the preparators of uh, torture. The Bahrain Center for Human Rights in its report um, recommend uh, the government of Bahrain to immediately stop the use of torture as a policy to extract uh, confessions uh, or to spread fear among uh, people and also to investigate uh, impartially and transparently the allegations of torture against uh, brought against uh, dozens of officers uh, involved in torture and violations, and also to hold accountable any person who was found guilty of committing or supervising the crimes of torture, and to end the culture of impunity among the security forces.
and to carry out comprehensive reforms to ensure transparency and legal accountability. And finally, to allow the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture to visit Bahrain urgently and allow him to work freely and meet the survivors of uh, tortures with no preset conditions. Uh, we also uh, urged the international community to request um, the government of Bahrain to allow the opening of a permanent office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to review Bahrain's implementation of its commitments and to request the government of Bahrain to extend an open investigation uh, on the torture allegations and also extend an open invitation to the UN Special Rapporteurs to visit Bahrain and allow them unconditional access to all places of detention. Uh, I'm sorry if it was long a bit and, um, and sorry to give also uh, harsh details of the torture practices, but I hope it was uh, useful, uh, useful input to this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, Asma, for your uh, presentation. Certainly, you have shed light of the deep-rooted issue in Bahrain. Uh, I remember receiving uh, the documentation after documentation from the country, from victims and of uh, human rights abuses or their family. One of the uh, uh, most revealing documentation that we always receive, the one that described torture, you just feel in that documentation how personalized the family becomes when they talk about the abuses that, that their loved one went through. Torture is not a crime is only committed against an individual. It's committed against the entire society because once you don't have accountability, once you don't have a, a, a system to hold those officials, whether it's direct or indirect, the chain of liability, accountable for these crimes, these crimes tend to happen again and again in the future. This remind me of the uh, law, law number 56, that the King of Bahrain has passed in early 2000, basically forgiving uh, all those officials who committed the crime uh, of torture uh, uh, in the country. With that, I would like to turn my uh, attention to Shawan, uh, uh, Shawan Jabbarin, the Secretary General of FIDH, for him to basically discuss uh, certainly Bahrain, but also give us a regional uh, uh, perspective on this, uh, uh, if we can call it the uh, pandemic in the field of human rights, the uh, heinous crime of torture. Uh, the floor is, a few, uh, is yours, Shawan. Chawan, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you well, but uh, the problem is in the mute, you know, from the host. That's the problem. <clears throat> anyway, I uh, would like to thank you, Hussein, you know, for your uh, introduction. And also, I would like, on behalf of uh, the FIDH, I would like to thank Gulf Center for Human Rights and all of its partners uh, this report. I think this is an important uh, report. We don't want to uh, look at it as an additional uh, and a new number. That's the problem. Uh, and I think this is uh, like uh, the uh, red flag for all of us, for the civil society, for the officials, for the third state parties, for the UN, you know that this is systematic. Uh, this is widespread practice. Uh, there is no accountability, and also there is a culture of impunity. I think if there is no accountability, the criminals, they will repeat their crimes and again and again and again. That's the main lesson. And there is a legal obligation for the third state parties. Uh, there is a legal obligation for everyone. Here we are not speaking about ethical obligation, we are speaking about legal obligation. And if there is an exceptional case in Bahrain or elsewhere over the world, I think no one can give a guarantee that this culture will not expand to other places and to different places. As a Palestinian, which I know what it means, torture, 
well. I know it as person also. I know it well. I think the uh, the uh, torture is like a ticking bomb in the body of the society. We have to look at it like that. And if regimes think that they consider torture and oppression as a way of control, it's a short vision and a short view. It will not. This shows, I think, the weakness things on the side and the body of any society. That's the case. And here, I think we have to look at it from this approach. Another thing is that I would like to address if the uh, crimes, violations, human rights violations continue and the, uh, the crime of uh, torture, it's, uh, you know, crimes against the humanity. And in the armed conflict, it's also a war crime. That's the case. We have to look at it like this. Here, just you can address the new generation. What you would like to say to the new generation, how you can maintain the hope their hope in the international law, in the international system. That's an issue I think it has to be concerned. Everybody dealing with rule of law in the earth. That's the issue. It's not just a Bahrain issue. No, no, it will affect others and others. Taking in my account, you know, the region in general, Middle East and North Africa. Here, it's also part of a widespread practice everywhere. And I would like to say that they are learning from each other's. If they see that there is nothing happened against, you know, the criminals here or there in Israel and Palestine and uh, Bahrain and uh, others, they will start saying, okay, and you can commit anything and nothing will happen against you. This is the lesson that they learn. And also when the minister of interiors they meet, they have their own meetings, you know, in the region also. Uh, they learn from each other about, you know, the types and methods and techniques they used. And they use it under the umbrella of fighting against terrorism. I think this is a ridiculous issue these days. That's, you know, what they try to justify. If you ask any official in the region, for instance, or elsewhere, what do you think about torture? They deny that it's happened. They deny and they start speaking about, you know, the uh, good laws that they have, the good practices, but this is, you know, the uh, exaggerations and allegations by the uh, civil society organizations. Uh, they are, uh, let me say, and uh, foreign agent, agents, that's the case. This is ridiculous. I think it's a time. It's a time to take things seriously. Because of that, I suggest, I suggest to sit an investigation commissioned by the Human Rights Council, for instance, to investigate what's going on and what's addressed today, you know, by the Gulf Center and by ASMA and by the uh, Bahrain Center for Human Rights and by the others. Maybe this is also a way. Why not to sit in, for instance, uh, a, an investigation commission to investigate uh, about the human rights violations taking, and mainly the serious ones of them, is the uh, torture issue. I think it's, it's a time to uh, set an investigation commission like this. Another thing also, it's for the uh, third state parties. It's a time, those they have also jurisdiction over the crime of torture to also to go after the, uh, the criminals, those they uh, practice, those they uh, committed, you know, all of the, uh, the kind of the, uh, uh, these crimes. It's a time. Without that, without that, thing will continue. Another thing is even the people, they will look at you, the officials, diplomats, other countries, you are part of the crime. That's the case. You're complicit with the crime. I think this is the main message that we have to address without any hesitation. That's the case. This is the only words that we have to say without any diplomatic way of addressing things. This is the case. If you support them, your business support them, uh, you receive them, and you know well that they are criminals, I think that's the problem. This is the problem. It's a time, I think, to maintain, it's a time to defend the rule of law, not just in one place, over the world. The world now is small. We learn it from each other's. We're learning from each other's. And I think it's a time. It's a time to uh, build 
and to emphasize, you know, and to restructuring even the tools and the institutions to respect the rule of law and to send to the new generation, mainly in this region also, that there is a rule of law, there is a democracy, there is an international law. It's not just things on the shelves. It's not norms on the shelves. It's a time to give a meaning to all of these things, the rule of law, and to practice it. That's the case. I think without that, without that, uh, the crimes will continue. Without that, the immigrants were looking for a new, uh, new areas and a new country to go to. And that's the issue. Here, you know, the problems from where. This is the root cause of all of these problems. Lack of accountability, lack of accountability. I'm here not speaking about only one place, many places. But let's go, for instance, to Bahrain. I myself hear the from colleagues from Bahrain, females also from Bahrain. Things you can't imagine that it's happened. You can't imagine that it's happened. I myself was affected by the stories that told to me, you know, when I met with colleagues also from Bahrain, from other countries also in, uh, in the region. I don't want to go in details, analyzing, characterizing what it means, you know, this legally, we know well that it's a crime. It's a crime against the humanity. That's the case. And it has to hold, you know, the criminals accountable. Without that, nothing will change. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Shawan, thank you very much for your presentation. I think uh, we have uh, uh, some time to go uh, through the uh, uh, question. I have received a lot. I'm not sure if I'll be able to, if we will be able to respond to all of them. Uh, I want to uh, start with one question to the entire panel. Uh, recommendations of the uh, uh, report call for accountability. Currently, uh, uh, we just recently, last week, we had a resolution in the European Parliament that raised the issue of torture, ill treatment, raised the issue of uh, accountability to some extent. Uh, European Union uh, overwhelmingly uh, adopted the Magnitsky Act. United States has uh, the Magnitsky Act. UK has the Magnitsky Act. Canada has the Magnitsky Act. So the question is to my panelists, is it time now for Bahrain to be held accountable under such act? And if that's the case, what kind of work we have to do in the non-government organization field to make sure these countries uh, uh, clear, clearly stated the, the role of UK? I would argue also, besides supporting her point, United States also plays a complicit role in torture uh, uh, in Bahrain by supporting the, uh, 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 the current government and not holding uh, the officials accountable to this heinous crime. So what kind of uh, accountability, accountability measures on the international stage could be these countries clearly stated the, the role of UK? I would argue that supporting her point, United States, and then Esma and, and Shawan, please. Uh, Claire, can you hear me? You cut out the same, but I can hear you now. Okay, did you hear my question? Could you repeat it for me, please? The, the uh, accountability measures, the accountability measures, uh, Magnitsky Act, in, in yes. many countries Perfect. around the world that have a strong ties with Bahrain. What kind of role we could do as a non-government organization to hold both the Bahrainis and those countries that adapted the Magnitsky Act uh, uh, to address the issue of torture in Bahrain? Yes, so I think crucially, and the point of our report really is saying that we need to move away, as Shawan so rightly pointed out, from looking merely at moral accountability. That's something we've been speaking about for a long time but to concrete legal accountability. And that means proper follow through. Um, and if I take the case of the UK again, I mentioned in the past year how a whole host of Bahraini officials have been welcomed with warm arms into Westminster. And if you look at Prince Nasser in 2014, the UK High Court ruled that he was not immune from um, prosecution in the UK. He did not enjoy diplomatic immunity. 
But I, I want to know, and we all want to know, why is he still coming to the UK? What is the justification for not holding him accountable? And I think that we do need to be looking at best, best practices internationally. Um, and we've seen the power of sanctions. We've seen the power of mechanisms such as universal jurisdiction. Recently, a German court has been helping to make sure that um, survivors of torture in Syria do not have a gap of accountability, that the perpetrators are not evading justice. They have used um, in universal jurisdiction in that regard. Um, to give a positive example from the UK in recent days, we've seen that they're opening investigations into Asma al-Assad um, and looking at her potential role there um, under universal jurisdiction as well, investigating torture and, and terrorism in that regard. We need to follow through. These don't need to stay on the shelves, as Siobhan said. We need to make sure that all of these mechanisms of legal, concrete legal accountability that we have that they need to be used, that proper accountability needs to happen, perpetrators need to come and face justice. And what can we do to follow up the next part of your question? We have all, as the international community, as human rights organisations, in partnership with human rights lawyers, we have all the evidence. I would say, listen to us. We have the witness survivors' testimonies. We have all of the reports. We're not turning these reports out into a void. We need those to be taken up by diplomats, by lawyers, and we need for cases to be built to ensure that these perpetrators are brought to justice. All of the information is there, the laws are there, the tools are increasingly strong as the Magnitsky laws, as you mentioned, let's use them for once. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Asma, if you would please uh, comment on that. Yeah, I totally agree with what Claire said and outlined, uh, of course. Um, um, I also said that naming and shaming is important in this procedure because if we don't know uh, publicly who uh, practice this kind of like uh, uh, torture and ill treatment, uh, they will always be um, uh, enjoying uh, impunity. Uh, so naming and shaming them is really important and that's why we thought that we should dedicate this entire section in our report just to outline their names, uh, their positions, what they have been um, involved in. Um, so that's what we can do and of course uh, the procedure of uh, holding all of the, these persons accountable should be very quite uh, transparent because without transparency we we cannot follow up we don't know what's happening we don't know if they're okay what if like the case was raised what happens next if it's not transparent how we can follow how we can track so the entire procedure should be uh, transparent because that would also scare the preparators themselves Thank you, Asma. Uh, Shawan? I think data is there, victims are there, uh, criminals are there. We Let's, are there. We are there. <laughs> Let's challenge the political will, the political system, and the legal system at the same time. Yeah. We have uh, courageous people everywhere and let's do that i think uh, just not just to repeat how many they were tortured and to account the sticks that the people they received let's go you know one step everywhere and i think it's good to remove the masks from the faces yeah. that's i think time this is the only way and let's continue you know the work Let's show the principles of international law. It's not a selective and it has not to be selective when, when you implement it or when we implement it. That's the case. If there is a selective case only, that's it. And we look at the principles as a selective things, this is the problem. I think we are courageous enough. Let's go for that. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Another question I received is the uh, crime of torture have an effect, as, as we stated earlier, not only on the individual, uh, 
but actually uh, the society, because once uh, the victim of torture is released into the population, he is not the, he or she, they're not the same person as they were uh, before uh, this crime were committed against them. So when it comes to rehabilitation, what kind of recommendation you have uh, in the case of Bahrain? What steps the government need to show uh, that they're serious about uh, uh, addressing the redress process, addressing the uh, victims of torture uh, to basically rehabilitate them? I'm not talking about just the financial compensation is, but actually their uh, their uh, position in the society and the psychological and the physical abuse they went through. Uh, same thing if I would, uh, if it's possible to start with Claire. Yes, I think one of the main things that would go towards remedying that is actually listening to the survivors. Um, Eunice's account that's in the report is extremely powerful in that regard. You have examples of people who say, I've, I've been tortured, this is illegal. Um, this should not be used against me in a court of law. To the contrary, I should be able to complain about this in a court of law. And so I think that across the board, from the police to the security forces, to, to the judiciary, there needs to be a full training on human rights, there needs to be a training on the admissibility of evidence in criminal procedures. And um, this is something that because it's a systemat systematic problem, it needs to have a systematic solution. And the chilling effect across the board on human rights defenders, peaceful protesters, the family members of torture survivors, this is something that really is so corrosive across society. The ripple effect, the psychological, the physical effects are so widespread here. But the first step, um, looking at baby steps in that regard, would be really to listen to survivors and to ensure that their complaints are upheld. And that would go a long way towards showing that this is not acceptable and will help rehabilitate um, as we put those systems in place moving forward on a very systemic level. Asma. Sorry, I keep uh, muting myself because my daughter keeps coming in the room. I'm confined in the bedroom. <laughs> so if I was a torture victim, I'm not a torture victim, but if I was a torture victim, what I would want is that the person who practiced torture against me would not be wandering around waving his hand like nothing has happened. So the government should hold accountable these persons. And then that's the first thing that would make a torture victim feel good about what, what just happened. Uh, I think uh, Convention Against Torture has a teeth and uh, it put also an obligation on the state parties to act. That's the case. Now the state parties they have to do. For me, the main thing for victims is the justice. Beside the rehabilitation, Beside all of these things, the psychological, financial, all of these things are important. But the main, main things, which it goes deeply in the mind and in the heart of the victims and his family or her family, is justice. To see, to see that justice is there. That's the main thing. And justice without accountability. No way. What justice you are speaking about? If the criminals are free, and commit their crimes again and again. And they are officers, they are kings, they are prime ministers, they are ministers. What? I think it's a time. That's, if they see that happened, I think it maintains everything in their side. It main, maintains their psychology, their faith, their beliefs, and uh, their human values. That's it. This is an important, I think. Accountability, accountability, and accountability. Without that, yeah. impunity will continue. Yeah, I think Shawan and I we both uh, agree on that. Justice is the best rehabilitation. In fact, well, I think uh, this is the uh, best way to uh, to conclude our event: justice and accountability.
when you have uh, uh, the same Minister of Interior for 10 years under his leadership, you have seen the abhorrent practice of torture in Bahrain still hold the same position that tells you there is no justice in the country, that tells you there is no accountability in the country. When you have uh, 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 the son of the king being promoted and not investigated on the alleged uh, crimes of torture that were committed uh, allegedly by him, that also tells you there is no justice or accountability. When you have scores of Bahrainis seeking uh, uh, asylum, like the, in the case of uh, the Sultan's brothers, or uh, so many others we have uh, uh, in, in Bahrain who now seek in justice system or seek an asylum in different European countries, or even here in the United States, that tells you there is no accountability and justice. In the past, it used to be abnormal to hear that you have Bahrainis applying for asylum here or there. Now it became the norm. It's unfortunate to show the current policies of the government, the Al Khalifa government, where it has led Bahrain. I would like to end by thanking my panelists, uh, Claire, Asma, and Shawan, and uh, mm -hmm. those who participated with us, whether it's from the uh, non government organization, diplomatic mission. Thank you very much. And I hope you join us in, in our next event. And I hope you work with us to basically hold the officials in Bahrain accountable and establish justice and redress for victims. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you, Shawan and Claire. Thank, Thank you so you much. Asma. Thank you, Shawan.